Introducing the Financial Power Program, offered by your Practice Management Consulting Group. We hope you enjoy these valuable excerpts of our very popular financial planning program, presented by its creator, P. Christopher Music, the Financial Prosperity Coach. Please visit FinancialPowerProgram.com for more information. For sound financial advice you can trust, Christopher Music, a 20-year veteran in the financial planning field, he's the person you can turn to. Christopher Music, who is also known as the Financial Prosperity Coach, is a best-selling author and a personal financial expert. He's been seen on NBC, CBS, ABC, and Fox affiliates around the country, on The Brian Tracy Show, as well as in Forbes magazine, Newsweek magazine, and various healthcare industry publications. Christopher is known for asking the question, how does one achieve predictable, measurable, and optimal financial conditions as a result of engaging in the financial planning process? Frustrated with the unpredictable and sometimes disastrous outcomes from inconsistent financial advice, he founded the subject of Econologics, results-based financial planning to standardize the next evolution in financial planning for America's households. Christopher is the founder of the Econologics Institute, a financial education company that provides books and courses on the subject to the public. He is the president of Econologics Financial Advisors, a registered investment advisor serving the financial prosperity needs of private practice professionals. I'd like to welcome you to the Household CFO course. Now this is a, a course that is part of a three course series specifically designed for private practice professionals. And I call it the Private Practice Millionaire Series. And we're gonna find out that uh, becoming a millionaire from private practice is the right thing to do. Okay, it's only a measure of how effective you are in delivering the help and services to your community in the particular profession you're in. I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is P. Christopher Music. That's my professional name. Uh, I'm known as the Financial Prosperity Coach. Uh, I have 20 years experience as a financial advisor and I quite literally spent about a million dollars out of my pocket finding out what did not work. And as I go through this, this uh, uh, introduction to what this household CFO course covers, uh, I'll share with you some of my, my experience and where I came from to, to put this information together for you. Uh, when I first got into the business, I, I started my own practice right out of graduate school. I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew I wanted to be in, in, in private practice as a financial advisor. So I graduated from uh, graduate school and I moved to Columbus, Ohio and spent two months getting a crash course in how to do financial planning from an associate of mine in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, came back, put my shingle out and said, here I am. Now, of course, I proceeded to starve for about two years until I actually figured out how to run a business. You would think getting a master's degree in business administration would prepare me on how to run my own business. And it didn't. So I was fortunate enough to get introduced to the same management system all of you have studied. And I was able to use that system to build up a practice over the course of about nine, 10 years. And I successfully transitioned it to my associate uh, as a solo practice for seven figures which really is not done in my industry uh, for solo practices. All because I was able to build a machine and build a duplicatable system that my associate was able to take on. And we did basically a flawless transition uh, over the course of, of uh, uh, several years. Uh, moved, to, moved to Florida and I became a certified business consultant in the management system that you're studying. And I was able to look at it from, uh, from your perspective, uh, being able to come in and see the problems within a practice and how to overcome those problems with marketing and personnel and uh, uh, finance and all those different functions that we all have to deal with. I decided in about uh, 2003 that I really wanted to get back into, into doing financial planning because I felt that uh, I found all these, these private practice professionals doing very well in their practices. But I also found that that economic value was not translated into the household. We make all this money, but we spend a lot more. The household is defined as the inhabitants of a dwelling. It comes from the German word hus, meaning dwelling, and Old English held, meaning protection. And I thought that'd be a very good uh, uh, meaning because really, wouldn't you like to be a little bit more protected? 
as a household? <coughs> of course, right? So uh, that's why we, we treat the household as our, our client or as the entity by which this information is applied. Primary, chief, is primary. One, first, highest. Financial, management of monetary resources. And officer, one charged with a position or duty. Comes from the Latin word officium, meaning duty. What's a duty? Something you must do, you're obligated to do for the benefit of those that you serve. Okay? And then we have course, is a curriculum of training to be able to perform the functions of the post. And what I have found is that there's a big disconnect between our, our professional lives, our professional practices, and the translation of that economic value to the household. Because you see, your practice is different than your household, isn't it? How many of you spend hours and hours every week in your professional practice or your business? Of course, right? Because, and why? Why do you do that? To protect it? Okay, what else? To make money, of course. What else? To serve, to help others, right? And how about professional satisfaction? How about being able to demonstrate competence in the field that you've spent so many years and hours learning to do? Now, would you agree that those goals are a little different than your household's goals? What are your household's goals? Exactly. This really comes down to two things, right? Time and money. And we're going to be having discussion about time and money for the next five days. Okay? It's time and money. Because you have goals, you have things you want to accomplish in your life that will, I would imagine, outside your practice. Is that true? Okay. And the way to uh, have the financial means to do that is to have an economic machine that produces enough revenue without your attention all the time, right? So that you can pursue other things of interest to you, like volunteering, pursuing some artistic endeavor, or even being an entrepreneur in some other field. It can go on and on. But that's what's important to you. Financial planning is merely the process of attaining the financial means to fund your goals. So that's really what, what you're doing as a household CFO is managing those resources so that your most, uh, most important goals can be attained for the members of your household. Do you see? So the, what this whole two and a half day course is about is, is the hat. It's the, the information that you need to know. Now, if you go out there into the financial world, there is, you can get a PhD in any one of the nine areas I'm, I'm going to be talking to you about in your financial life. But the thing is, is that you don't have time to get a PhD level of understanding in investments, do you? Or asset protection? Mm -hmm. Or debt and credit management? Or inco retirement income? Wouldn't you like to have the Cliff's Notes version? Really? The shortcut, right? Because you, you're going to find, as we go through this course together, you're going to find that most of the information you've been given is, in fact, incorrect. That's why it's so complicated and so um, onerous for you as a non-financial professional to be able to figure out what's going on. Because most of the information you're getting is a blind trail. So if you, tra if you bring it all back to the fundamental basics, and we move forward from there into how to apply those basics in your life today, despite of all the noise out there, you're going to make much further ground than you would if you listen to everybody and go off on this direction, that direction, and that direction, and so on. Which is, unfortunately, how we find ourselves going. The question is, who do you trust, right? Mm -hmm. It's always a big deal. I'm older than a lot of people here, so I figured there really wasn't anything I was going to be able to use. I figured I was going to find out some things I did right and a lot of things I did wrong and that there wasn't any time to change it. And other clients of ours that are of the age I am um, have the same experience of there's so much that you can still do and it's not like you know you're out of time or it's hopeless um, most of our clients I'd say 50 percent of our clients that have come here felt hopeless um, and now they don't and that's a wonderful feeling we realize that we need to do a better job of allocating where we spend our money um, I do feel like we are making a lot of money. Uh, they've, 
indicated that. We just need to figure out how to keep more of it. Well, before we decided to take this course, I think that we both felt that we were kind of in a state of confusion, um, doubt about where we were going to end up, how we were going to end up in the places where we wanted to end up. Um, I guess before I, we started taking or considering taking this course or taking the course, um, I wasn't really very financially involved. So I think it's made me become more aware and um, take a m more action myself in our finances and overall. I felt my financial experience was very limited. I didn't think I, uh, I really had the basics of balancing a checkbook and wasn't sure how I was going to achieve any financial goals. They seemed like pipe dreams in the beginning. I think I was a little bit lost, uh, just kind of uncertain about where I was going and, and whether my steps I had taken in the past were actually uh, helping me or not. Before I took the course from Christopher Music, um, I had a lot of confusion about certain aspects um, of my financial condition, mainly a lot of retirement, um, legal aspects, and um, investment, d different investment aspects. I, I just had some confusion on it. It was really just kind of my gut instinct on how I handled those things. The first item of business is we have to, to arrange the importance of the entities that are part of your life. Now, Econologics, as a subject, treats the household as the client, as the entity to which Econologics methodology is applied. Econologics is a results-based financial planning system that is implemented by a well-defined economic unit, the household. Econologics focuses on households instead of individuals or small business because the household is the entity that merges individuals together into economic units who ultimately own or control practically all assets in the world. The derivation of household is from the German Hus, meaning dwelling, and Old English Hjald, meaning protection. So it is appropriate to implement strategies that improve the financial and economic condition of a household to protect itself and its members. The fact is, your household is a business. Let's examine why. Your household has a specific legal location, your street address. It has income and expenses, assets, what you own, and liabilities, what you owe. The executives are you, or you and your spouse, who make the day-to-day -day financial and strategic decisions. Your household reports its financial status each year to the IRS through an income tax return. You have a federal tax identification number, your social security number. The government taxes your household as a business, and so it is. Your household is a parent company to every asset you own, your house, retirement plans, your small business or private practice, and any other valuables. The profits flow from those assets to assist the members of the household to achieve their most valued goals and purposes. When you begin to treat your household as a business, especially with an intention to make a profit, you will make more successful financial decisions for you and your family. Your household has an overall financial condition whether it's a good one or a bad one. This condition ultimately determines whether your goals will be met or not. To discover the current financial condition of your household, visit financialprosperityindex.com today. Like we said before, the goals of the household business are different than the goals of any business that is owned by the household. Because you see, everything else you have in your life, from an economic perspective, is junior to that household. Every household is following a financial plan. Did you know that? Every single household is following a financial plan. Now, you're following one of two plans. Either your own financial plan, which is written and used and implemented or you're following the default financial plan that someone else has written for you. So immediately we can tell where we are in just that comparison alone. But let's take a look at the default financial plan so we actually realize that it is a financial plan, first and foremost. And then we can start comparing it to where we are, where we want to be. 
So the first thing we have to recognize is that there is a default financial plan, but I, I uh, call it the four horsemen of your economic apocalypse. And the reason why I, I, I frame it that way is because this plan is not designed for your affluence. It's designed, unfortunately, to relieve you of your affluence. And you might be feeling this a little bit as you, as you go through year after year, uh, working your business, doing all the things you're doing, and finding out you're not getting ahead as you want to, as ahead as you want to. So here's what they are. You have to know what you're, what you're dealing with. The first uh, item is inflation. Now, what is inflation? You, as a private practice professional, trying to get ahead and trying to plan for your future, what do you think the value of money is going to be in 20 years? Much less. So if we know that and can predict that, do you think we should do something about it? Exactly. Okay? But the mass population out there doesn't get it. Doesn't understand that's what's going on. And so what happens is the, the, the standard of living declines because the dollars we have in our pocket keep buying less and less and less and less. So eventually $50,000 a year of income buys what? Nothing. A, you know, a studio apartment, you know, and an inexpensive car, and just enough to eke out an existence. Well, I don't think you want that for you. But that's the plan that's, that's set in, because everybody has to deal with inflation. So we have to figure out how to, to overcome that part of that plan. The second one is income, gifts, and estate taxes. What's income tax? Income tax is a surcharge on income earned. That's all it is. A surcharge. You made income, we charge you. That's income tax. So what happens if you make more income? More you get to pay more tax. How many, of you think, how many of you think that is a good part of your plan? <laughs> okay, good. Well, what do you think is the largest single expenditure you're going to have in your lifetime? Taxes. So if we don't have a good tax plan, we're going to get popped. You see? And I tell you, everyone in the room is probably paying five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 more a year in tax than you have to. Have you, any of you ever gone to a, a tax course? No. Well, gee, we should probably have one. That's why I'm developing one. But that's beyond the, 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 uh, beyond the material we're covering today. But did you know that income tax, 100% uh, of income tax collected goes to pay the, the interest on the national debt? It doesn't go to pay for all the things we're told it pays for. So how do they pay for everything else, like bridges and roads and stuff? Well, there are constitutional taxes that have been there since the founding of the Constitution that run the government. Mm -hmm. And those taxes go and pay for the necessary functions of government, as they always have. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay, now the, second, the third thing is interest on debt. Okay, now, I'm gonna, you don't have to raise your hands on this one, but how many of you are in debt? <laughs> Well, let me ask you this question. How many of you would like to be out of debt? Yay. Yes. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with being out of debt. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing. Because once you're out of debt, guess what? You're on your own life. There's an element of freedom attendant to being out of debt. So you can imagine then that part of the financial plan I think you'd want to have for yourself is being out of debt, right? But what do you think the default financial plan is for you? Stay in debt as much as possible. And you're going to learn some pretty interesting statistics as we go through this course about how exactly that's done and how it's promoted through the financial planning community as being a great thing for you, which I can't... If it doesn't make sense to you mathematically, it doesn't make sense, no matter how they spin it or how they justify it. Okay? So we're going to have some very interesting talks on that particular point. Okay? And finally, market manipulation. Market manipulation. How many of you have invested money for retirement and had it go down in value? Was that fun? <laughs> Did you get up in the morning and go, great, I lost 40% of my retirement account today. I am jazzed. Of course not, not unless you're nuts. Or you're a true speculator and you know you, can you have a bunch of money on the sideline to buy it when it's that low. But how many of you have the intestinal fortitude to when the market crashes 40% to say, yippee, I got all this cash, I'm going to throw it in the market today. Nobody. Fascinating. Fascinating the disconnect between 
theory and practice. And that's what we find to be the biggest problem is there's beautiful theory out there, but it's never practiced because you're human beings. How many of you enjoy losses? Uh-uh. If you just add up in the last 20 years, add up all the money you've paid in income tax, interest on debt, and money that you've lost in the markets or in investments, any investment. Add all that up compared to how much money you have now. Is there a difference? Probably. Well, we find that a lot of people will, will have a lot more being spent because don't forget inflation in the last 20 years has cut your earning power in half. Okay, you add all these up and the amount of money here is usually greater than the net worth of most uh, private practice professionals. Now, let me ask you, is there a financial plan? There is. This is all designed by design. It's the, it's the Federal Reserve Bank and the government. And that's all I'm going to say about it at this juncture, okay? But that is, that is the financial plan, the default financial plan, that the average American citizen is following. And why? Is it any wonder why the 1% get richer and the 99% get poorer? Is it any wonder why the middle class is disappearing? This is why. Because the value of the production that you created is transferred through th these four mechanisms to institutions to the 1%. That's what's going on. Chris's system is so simple. It's like uh, I have an MBA in finance. I think one of the wins is just taking the, making us take the time to think of what we really should be looking at in our finances and just our personal goals and where we want to be in, you know, in the future. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think a big win is just making us take the time to settle down uh, to figure out where we want to be. He felt like this was getting an MBA uh, going through the five days and uh, he's very excited about it. He refers others now to come to this. Um, we have clients, we have some clients in Montana. And they kind of live out in the boondocks. Um, and what they came out of it was they're going to be able to educate their children. Well, I think it's a good course for them to take because I really like the way the, uh, they go about putting everything down on statistics and you can look at it and it's not wondering whether you're doing a good job or not. You have actually ways to measure it. That's really what got me signed, sealed, and delivered on the course. Before I took the course, um, whenever I would go to the bank, um, to I have a line of credit at the bank, and so um, each time, each year, I would have to kind of go over all of my financial information. And um, what I had noticed was the last two financial um, information that I had given to the bank, I actually was going down in, in my assets. When I completed the course, put the steps into action, and did my last, my most recent financial plan, actually on paper, I am a millionaire. I've known Christopher for quite a few years, and owning a consulting company and working with many, many private practitioners, we would help them expand their company, expand their company, expand their company. And then as the years go by, I'd sometimes ask, how are you doing financially? And sometimes I would get like, I'm doing about the same as I was doing before financially. They weren't managing that success, the financial success of building their practice. So I got connected up with Christopher and we started sharing some ideas back and forth of how we can better help our clients and, and have them have the wealth and have the security that building up a successful practice creates. And He's been putting together some training things with our clients. Most recently is a Conologics program that has been just knocking it out of the park. The relationships that he's been developing with the, our clients over the past few years has been phenomenal. And their sound security, their financial solvency has changed dramatically. And their ability to look at the future and know that it's going to be bright and themselves and their family and their practice are all taken care of is wonderful. So I'm very pleased to have a relationship with Christopher and the help that he provides for our clients. The reason why he works with many of my clients is he handles a major, major problem. See, we help our clients generate a lot more income. However, that doesn't mean that they're going to know how to control their income effectively. What he does is he teaches them how to actually control it in a way where their income actually continues to rise. Hi, Dr. Joel Parker here, president and co-founder of Veterinary Practice Solutions. Uh, I've been a consultant now in the veterinary industry for going on seven years, another 10 or so before that. 
Uh, and it's been a long time coming to actually find a course like Christopher Music's Hustle CFO course. I personally attended this course and had great gains and great wins and got a great foundation of financial planning out of this. Uh, and this is a course that I highly recommend to anybody in the veterinary field to come and do uh, with your spouse or your business partner so that you can come and take control of your household finances as well as the practice finances. So if you're looking for, first of all, a good foundation uh, to get hatted on and trained on, plus a series of to-do steps to go back to start grasping and, and pulling in the financial reins of your own financial destiny, let's call it, then this is the course for you. You guys need to do it. Now, what is Ecologics? I've used the word a couple times. Well... It is simply defined as a study and practices of managing the financial matters of a household. Okay, but Christopher, isn't that what financial planning is? Well, yeah, it is. But ecologics is also another thing. It is the standardization and codification of financial planning policies and procedures to achieve a predictable and consistent results toward an optimum financial condition for a household. Now, this optimum financial condition is something that is definable, measurable, experienceable. That's a new word. <laughs> okay? But it's something that you know you're experiencing. Because if you have your attention off of financial problems, can you put them on other problems that may be more life-fulfilling? Of course. So it's a whole idea of getting your plan in place. Now, the interesting part of it is, is that I actually coined this word. This is an invented word, and it's derived from the ancient Greek, from the word oikonomos, meaning the management of a household, logi, study of, ecos, practices or skills. Now, I had to come up with this terminology to differentiate what I do with every other experience you've had with any financial professional who calls themselves a financial planner. Because financial planning technology has only evolved to a certain level. And I have taken the existing technology and brought it to a new level of evolution. You see? So, that's what Econologics is. Now, it is the re re first results-based financial planning system. Now, what do, we, what do I mean by results-based? Well... It is a system. A system, by definition, is a regularly interacting or interdependent group of items forming a unified whole. So what happens is you're going to find that the ecologics as a subject is a unified system. It's a whole financial planning program designed to get you from whatever condition you are today financially, whatever problem you have that you're trying to solve, whether it's getting out of debt, whether it's putting money away for retirement, whether it's uh, um, figuring out how to sell your business or exit out of it. Whatever the problem that is, it has a solution to take you from where you are right now to a definable optimum that we all agree on, and then we work out the path to get there. It's sim simply what it is. Now, it doesn't play nice with other systems because there are, I haven't found any other systems. I found tips and tricks. I have found, hey, you got this tax problem, try to do this. If you watch these, some of the gurus on television, they do what's called spot coaching. Someone will call in with a particular problem. Well, you just do this and do that and do that, and your problem is solved. Well, that's great. But how does that affect everything else going on in your financial life? Because all the advice being given by most advisors is specifically to their own specialization. What kind of advice does your accountant give you? Tax, Tax advice, right? What kind of information does uh, an investment person give you? Investment. investment advice. And how about insurance agents? Insurance, insurance advice. And legal? Your attorney? Legal. legal advice. Now, interestingly enough, in most cases, does your accountant talk to your attorney, talk to your insurance person, talk to your investment person? No. No coordination. Therefore, no system. Who pays for that? You do. Just in, in inefficiency alone. You see? So we try to, to solve this problem by creating a system. It's from the Greek system, a whole compounded of several parts. And your, your financial life is nine parts, you're going to find. <clears throat> now, this is the only personal financial planning system that integrates with the management system that you have been trained in. Okay? Because 
you'll understand there's the conditions. Okay? And different conditions have different states of operation. And you're going to find that your financial condition at home is in a state of operation, whether a good one or a bad one. That's not the point. The point is there are step-by-step -step actions we take to improve the condition, no matter where it is, to an optimal one that saves you both time and money. It's real simple. First of all, we have to ask you, is your goal to make the best return on your investments? Okay, like a retirement account? Okay. Uh, is your goal to, uh, to have insurance? Okay. Is your goal to uh, pay your debts? Okay, good. Now, what is, what is all that part of? A condition. Don't you want to have a positive, successful financial experience? Is that what that sums up to? Because really, if we make money on investments, we have a positive experience, do we not? If we save money in taxes, we have a positive experience. If we make a lot of money in our business and show competence in that area, we have a positive experience. How many of you like to have a negative ex financial experience? So you see, the whole purpose of what we're trying to achieve here is an optimum of an experience as we can have, despite all the nonsense and crazy stuff going on. So the way we have to figure that out is figure out, really, where we are. What experience are we really having? Because you see you're all in this little universe called your own household. And you're, you're operating on information told to you from where? Where do you, where do you get your financial information from? Random sources. Random sources, <laughs> financial advisors, accountants. Where do they get their information from? The same place as you do. They do, more often than not. There's a few you know, industry-only type of sources. But did you know that the, that the vast majority of everything you see, hear, and smell about money comes from six multinational corporations? Six. They own all the magazines, TV stations, radio, sources of financial information. Six of them. Now, is that unbiased advice or unbiased information? I would think not. And if one thing I can get out of you, out of this time we have together, is your ability to look. Just look. Because really, at the end of the day, the only thing I would think you'd be interested in is results. And if you're not getting results, then something is wrong. So you're trying to operate on some piece of information that is completely false. That's the factor of it. So if you can strip away all the, the things we're trying to do that don't get results, then we have a much better chance of having a positive financial experience, right? How many of you would like that? Of course. Okay. If I could advise somebody to take the course, I would tell them to do it. Um, I'm definitely the bigger skeptic in our family, and I think that just even being a day in, I feel much more aware and much more confident, and I think this course would definitely help your private practice, just even in just a sense of where you are financially or what you want your practice to to give you. Yeah, I'd agree with that too. I think, you know, even if you're just in doubt of what you should do, this is just a whole other set of information, a set of data to help you to make that decision on whether or not the decision you make is the right one in the end. I wish I could have done it when I opened my practice 27 years ago. This would have, I'd probably be retired today uh, and with a lot less stress in my life. But I would, I would highly recommend anybody to uh, start looking at the financial process in their life and to see how they can improve it. We have a big size company like uh, 70 staff we have and I think everybody needs it. Two people company or 100 people yeah. company or 1000 because he's simplified and you don't waste your time. Oh I think the course is going to pay for itself. I'm there, there you go, you want the return on investment, bam, you got it. One of the key aspects in it is to not procrastinate, and I'd say if you want to get anywhere, we need to do it ourselves. You know, we're, we're already starting our professions a little bit later in life, and we're getting older, and that hasn't slowed down any, so you need to get on it. The advice that I would give anybody thinking about taking the course would be to uh, just kind of look at their condition and decide, am I where I want to be right now? If you're not where you want to be right now, 
then you've got to give yourself more education on how to get to the point where you want to be. Um, so this course lays out every aspect of making money, preserving your assets, and actually gaining more money in the end. So it just gives you an absolute plan that you set into place. It's your goals. It's your plan that you set up based on the information. So I would say get the education because it'll get you where you want to be in the end. We have some clients that as a result of uh, um, doing this, these courses with Christopher, um, some of these clients we've had for 25 years. So these are clients that are become friends. Uh, they're almost like family, and I don't trust them to anyone. <laughs> and um, every single one of them um, has come up to me and thanked me uh, for getting them to come to these seminars. Some of them I had to twist their arm a bit to get them here. Um, but one for one, every single one of them has thanked me. What I see with a lot of our clients who have been to his courses and have done his training is that they kind of just calm, they kind of chill, if you will, of like what are the things that they need to do with their organization so that those monies can flow upward to the household corporation, so to speak, that demands it all, right? And so what I found is they they do some kind of testing with these guys, which has been like absolutely amazing. But they have them take this test. And that test looks at several different areas of how they manage themselves financially. You know, from investments to wills, et cetera, right? And they, there's a score. And the guys take the score. They start working with them. They do this training with them. And then they, they start, the clients start putting together programs um, that will start to turn things into a more positive direction. And then when they retake the test, they actually score significantly higher. They feel so much more calm. They know precisely what they're trying to handle next on, the, on trying to build their self and, more, and create more security for themselves and their families. The biggest single factor that really hit me, because like everyone, we buy into accumulating debt. And that single element for myself and my family is the biggest source of stress that there is. And to actually see and learn how you can, step by step, get yourself out of debt in a very scientific way so that not only do you not have debt anymore, but you actually are creating a cushion to fall back on. It gives you a future financially. And instead of dragging the tin cans of the past of debt along with you through your life. And that is no fun at all. And I anticipate having a lot more fun as I apply these data. Now what is the optimal financial condition? Well, it all is all summed up this way. There are nine parts to your financial life. Each part has to, in itself, be optimum. The only way we can do that is to start with the result specifically defined in mind. Once we define what that result is, then we can look back and see what holes we have in our path to get there. It's kind of like sitting on a brick wall. You ever try to build a house or try to you build something on a house, you're sitting on a foundation, let's say it's a brick foundation. So let's say you're sitting on a four foot foundation for a house, you're looking down and you say there's a brick gone there, that brick's cracked, the mortar's gone there. What's going to happen to that foundation? It's going to crumble over time, right? Well, every part of your financial life is like a brick wall. And, all, and, and every one of you in the room has some bricks here, you got some mortar here, you got some structure here, but it's not a solid foundation. And if it's not a solid foundation, we have uh, a situation where we are in a dangerous condition. It's dangerous because sooner or later we're going to have a cracks in the, in the foundation and shifting and non-optimum results. So let's take a look at these nine elements and see how they all work together. First of all, a written comprehensive financial plan. Your plan. Your plan. Not the default. Now your plan is, is summed up. Uh, we, we have a roadmap which is the implementation of how to get this optimum financial condition that, we, uh, that everyone in the room has, has, uh, who's done this course has, has um, acquired. And in that financial plan, what we do is we go through and we, we fill in all the blank spots in your foundation. Put, get the mortar back in, replace the bricks out, put in new bricks. 
whatever the case may be, to create that solid wall. Knowledge and certainty in personal finance. Again, you're a non-financial professional. You should not have to go to school for a year or two years to learn this material. Well, let's just take a look. Let's take a quick inventory. How many of you were taught about personal finances in elementary school? Middle school? How many of you took home ec? What did you learn at home ec? How to cook, how to sew, how to make brownies? How many of you were taught about how to balance a checkbook? Yeah, a couple of you. Okay, that's before they deleted it, right? Okay, because what is economics is the management of a household. What's the one of the main things you need to manage in a household? It's finances, right? So understand that your financial education has been deleted. I want you to get that. It's not like it's because it's been overlooked. It's been deleted. Did you learn about it in high school? College. Grad school. I went to school for finance and economics, and I didn't learn anything about how to manage a household or how to ha handle my own personal finances. I would say the CFP curriculum, they don't teach you that there either. Some of it. Some of the technical stuff, but not the basics. So you see, how in the world can we possibly act competently if we've never been trained on the fundamentals of the subject? If I were to ask any of you right out of college, go start your own clinic. This is before you even learn how to, how to you know, do, you know, like a veterinarian. Let's say you're right, right now beginning vet school. And they say, okay, we're going to go out and we're going to neuter a dog. How do you think that's going to go? Not, well. Not so well, huh? Not so well. Well, then is it any wonder why when we try to make decisions regarding our, our, our financial futures, sometimes it just doesn't go so well. Now you see, here's one thing I want to tell you. This comes from, a, from a, an author named Barry James Dyke, very smart guy. And he made this comment. He said, if you're not paying for your financial advice, the advertiser is. That's something to think about. If you're not paying for it, the advertiser is. So I had to create as, as basic of a course as I could come up with to teach you the basics on how to think your way around your financial decisions the rest of your life without being dependent upon anybody else for that. And that's what the result is this household CFO course. Okay? Now the other part of it is, is obviously you need to make a lot of money. That's the business viability course, the day and a half where we work on those 12 laws of income for your practice. And then finally, all of you are gonna be exiting your practice someday, right? Did you know there's a lot of rules a lot of procedures, a lot of information you need to know about, how to, ex about a, how to build maximum value in your practice so you can transfer it to somebody else for maximum value. There's seven ways you can exit your business. You have to learn that technology so you can apply it profitably to your life. You get the idea. So that's what this five days encompasses is the whole life cycle of a private practice owner, financially speaking. It's all for the purpose of bringing the maximum value into the household. Okay? So that's what that's all about. Now, your business has to be cranking. And I want every, all of you to have a written exit strategy. It's down. I'm going to be doing this at this time with these people. You can change your mind tomorrow, but at least it's a written plan. That's one thing I found. When I sold my practice, I had written 10 years prior on paper exactly when, how much, what I was going to have, so on and so forth, and Laughing as I left signing the, the papers, I realized that everything I had written down on that paper had come true. Fascinating. You know, it's beginning with the end in mind. Every entrepreneur, real estate mogul, what do they do? They figure out their exit before they ever get into the deal, right? Prior practice owner, your practice is an asset. So you want to figure out an exit strategy. <clears throat> Why well, move along? Provision for higher current and future income. Setting side money away for future use. Being completely debt free. Completely debt free. Now, there's only one caveat to that, and the caveat is if you have business uses for debt, which we'll go over, there's a, that's fine. There's, reasons when, there's times when you pay it off, times when you don't. Okay? But 
All consumer debt should be debt free. Your house should be paid off. I don't care what anybody's telling you. It's not a business asset. It's a personal asset and it's expensive. It's expensive. So pay it off. Okay? Be, have a complete and orderly estate plan. Why? Because something's going to happen to you someday. And you want those people to, you love to be able to handle your affairs without all the upset and, and, and confusion and cost that accompanies that. You want your taxes to be minimized every year as best you can as you grow your, your wealth. Practically, practically all assets are protected from loss. You should be able to, to, uh, to structure your affairs so that you know with a high degree of certainty that no matter what happens, you've got the basics covered. And I think that's what, that's what we mean by peace of mind. How many of you like peace of mind? Yeah. Pretty nice commodity, isn't it? And a stable investment experience. I've already talked about that. Do you see how this is optimum? All of these nine elements must be in, must be in, in each of them approaching their ideal. Once that's in, then we continue to review it on an annual basis to keep moving to higher, higher states. Now, here's another issue. Now, that we, so if we could define what the optimum estate plan is, what the optimum tax plan is, the optimum in investment experience, written down in detail that we all agree upon, then we have to come down to the other basic. How in the world do we know if we're achieving it? Because you see your financial life is based on what right now? Subjective experience, right? Well, I guess we're doing as well as our neighbors are. Well, I like my financial advisor. He's been good for us. When the market crashed last time, we didn't lose that much. Those are subjective, aren't they? Well, if you were trying to, to manage your practices on subjective measurements, how well are you going to manage that practice? Not so well, huh? You want objective measurement. It was done or not done? It's this condition or not? So, <clears throat> one of the innovations we had to come up with was measurement of a management of a household. I had to come up with 18 different statistical measurements to measure different aspects of whether or not we're achieving that optimal financial condition. Nine I borrowed from the business world because they were applicable. But nine I had to innovate because where is this, uh, a metric that we can use to measure what percentage of your assets are generally protected from creditors? We should have a number to show that, right? Or the completeness of your estate plan. Or how about mathematically uh, showing a ratio between the rate of risk you're taking in your investment program versus the rate of return? Numerical, mathematical formula, not just a guess. Is that more uh, scientific? More standard? Exactly. Now, one thing I want to share with you is a, uh, a concept called the private practice millionaire. And this, there are three elements to your life that we're going to be covering wholly throughout these next five days. Because you have three hats to wear, three very specific functions. The first one is your technician function. You have to be the absolute best at what you do for your community. The best PT, the best veterinarian, the best dentist, the best optometrist. I mean, wiping out your competition as far as technical skill results. Okay, you went to school for many years for that, trained thousands of hours for that. That should be pretty well in hand. But then we have the executive function. And this is what determines how well, how much money you make really. How well you can get your team to coordinate and uh, work together. Now here's the secret. Do you want to know the secret of being free of your practice? How many of you want to be free of your practice? So you can do whatever you want to. You can work on it, not work in it. You can sell it, not sell it, whatever. The secret is training your staff. That's the secret. Training your staff. Because here's the truth of it. Let's say you spent $300,000 on training your staff. 
your five, six, eight, ten staff people on how to be executives in their own posts, how to do their jobs better, how to, how to uh, um, be more productive. Do you, th 300,000, let's just say. Outrageous number, isn't it? Okay. Well, what would happen then if we were able to create a uh, $500,000 increase in, in income of the practice every year because of that? What kind of return on investment is that? That's a lot better than, get, than a mutual fund. Do you see what I mean? So your attention should be on building your machine, not whether or not you're getting a point, uh, a percent return better than another person in your investment account, your retirement account. To get the idea. We're looking at it from your household perspective, not just the little universe of your retirement account. Okay? And there's no better returns on investment anywhere in your life than training yourself and your staff as Cracker Jack executives. That's because here's the thing when you can leave your practice for 60 days and the income goes up, that's when you got a machine. That's when you got something that someone else wants to buy. Maximum value in the marketplace. And that leads us to the next point is the owner hat. Because as an owner of an investment, you have the responsibility of maximizing the value, both social and economic, value of that enterprise. You're responsible for the vision, the mission, the group dynamic, not to mention legal rudiments, tax rudiments, and so on. And that's a very specific thing we cover uh, a lot on the exit planning course. But those three are your three responsibilities. And if you take those to the highest level of professionalism, you got it made. You've got it made. Do you see what I mean? I think just seeing that there is steps that we can take to fix our situation is huge. I mean, just being able to look forward to the future and not worry about it. I feel like it's, it was peace of mind. I like the step-by-step -step approach. You know, you do this, then you do this, then you do this. I just like the, the layout of the step-by-step. -step. Um, the major wins I can see is there's already some basic truth that's been given on, and the biggest truth is that anything's possible. We just have to set our mind to it and really find the right discipline and focus to to achieve it and, and you'll do it. Right now I'm at the stage where I'm just now uh, understanding what I have to do to meet my goals and uh, I didn't realize uh, the steps I'd actually have to take. It's a bigger hurdle than I had expected but it, it, I didn't realize that and of course if I didn't know that I wouldn't have I wouldn't have gotten there. So now I know what, it, what it's going to take to, to meet my goals long term and I can I can work toward in that direction. My wife and I, um, I would say the only area we've ever had uh, arguments in has been the area of finance. Um, we've known each other for about 12 years now and um, that is the only area where we start to get into some some type of disagreement. Well we did uh, Christopher's program and uh, we haven't had a single disagreement since that time. We know exactly how to operate with one another and uh, really that's what we were missing. You know in other areas of life we knew how to operate with one another. We knew who was wearing what hat and it wasn't until we did Christopher's program where we really went oh you're wearing that hat and I'm wearing that hat and we just got into action with one another and it's been phenomenal our income has grown considerably um, we have far better control of our income we spend our money in a very wise way now we don't just waste and uh, it, it was it was a big big deal for us big big deal for us after the course was over the biggest win that I had was that I actually was able to take each one of the points from the course and formulate my own plan of how to get to my ultimate goal for when I retire um, an exit planning strategy for my corporation and figure out kind of how to get from where I'm at now and where I'm supposed to be at the end of the time and actually have the steps planned out so that it made it easy for me to actually implement those steps and get there. There's disagreements about money or how you handle the money or this, that, and the other thing. Uh, this allowed both my wife and I to get on the same page and be in agreement. And where there's agreement, you have flow, you have expansion. And it's helped us out quite a bit that way.
a company that's been in business for over 30 years, we have um, personality types from one end of the spectrum to the other. Um, so I interviewed all of the clients in terms of how they, what kind of results they felt they got from the seminar or how the seminar matched their, uh, what they wanted to do. And we have one client that is just, you know, he's Mr. New York, just go, go, go. We've got to like run fast to stay ahead of him. He always wants everybody to be one step ahead of him. And he said it was perfect pace for him. Uh, that um, the seminar just, you know, kept him going and kept him interested. And then we have another client that if you give her too much to do, she just throws her hands up in the air and goes, I can't do anything, stop. And she thought it was perfect also in terms of she never felt overwhelmed uh, with the information, even though there's a lot of information. And she felt she could use every single bit of it when she got done with the seminar. I actually didn't think I would sit through the seminar. I thought I would just be here to see our clients and schmooze. Um, and I was riveted uh, every single day. And uh, I keep coming back. It's kind of like getting rehabilitated on it. Um, what I did about a month ago is I took all of our consultants and brought them to this seminar. I've never taken all of our consultants off post for three days to take them anywhere. <laughs> and <coughs> they were kicking and screaming. Um, saying, well, what if we don't like it? Can we, you know, only go for a day? So look, after the first day, if you don't like it, you don't have to stay. And after, by lunch, they were coming up to me going, this is awesome. And they stayed. So we're now getting, you know, our whole technical um, personnel educated on this uh, so that we can help our clients and get them directed to Christopher. You know, when clients come to us, we want to get them in a condition to where they can have enough knowledge to run their practice uh, so it runs on its own, giving them more freedom to do what they want. Our clients, <clears throat> we, they come to us either in a good condition or a bad condition, but usually some area of their practice is pretty much out of control. Uh, we show them how to become more profitable by increasing their volume. But usually the volume increases and their spending increases as well. And so they don't have very much control of their finances. So what we do, by putting them through Christopher's program, they get more control of their finances where they uncover some really gross areas, you know, of neglect. Because in this day and age, you have to be prepared for the future. And very few people are prepared for what's coming down uh, over the next couple of years. My name's Hillary, and I'm the CEO of a consulting company. What impressed me most about the Household CFO course was just the, the ease with which I can now make decisions on my finances, on the finances of my company, on the finances of my household, because I am, in fact, the household CFO in my family. So before it was a little bit hit and miss, and you tended to watch television or respond to ads or whatever because you didn't really have anything to use as a guideline. So I really, really love this course because it has guidelines. It has now stable data that I can use in my life in every single aspect of my financial management of my company and my household. And I love that. Ecologics as a subject I thought should have a credo so that we're all on the same page as to where we are going as a group working together in this particular area. So I wrote up a credo. A credo is a statement of beliefs. The Credo of Econologics. One, productive people have basic human rights to personal wealth and prosperity. Two, the basics of personal finance and economics are simple to understand. Three, the subjects of personal finance and economics are made unnecessarily complex and difficult to understand to the degree that they serve special interests. 4. The application of the basic principles of personal finance and economics can improve the financial condition of any household. 5. There is an optimum financial condition for any household which can be defined, measured, and experienced. 6. The standardization and codification of the goals, purposes, policies and procedures of personal financial planning create a solution that can realize the optimum financial condition for any household. 7. 
education on the natural laws, basic principles, and standard procedures in the fields of personal financial planning and economics is necessary to attain an optimum financial condition. 8. The optimum financial condition can only be achieved by resolving problems related to all nine elements of a comprehensive financial plan and moving each element toward its ideal state. 9. The condition of the national or world economy is a sum of the economic conditions of its households and that the improvement of the larger economy starts with the improvement of the financial condition of each household. 10. The activity of econologics is to attain and maintain the optimum financial condition for a household by implementing standard financial solutions based on fundamental truths and not arbitrary or authoritative opinions to the highest possible degree. 11. The purpose of econologics is to improve the financial condition of the household toward the optimum so that the most valued goals and purposes of its members can be fully realized. 12. The goal of econologics is to create people with increased confidence, competence, and certainty in their financial decisions so they can predict and control their financial future and ultimately own their own lives. I was just kind of blown away. I was like, wow, this guy is he's just really passionate and it really drew me in to see his passion for it and, and how he really wanted to teach it. Christopher is um, an excellent speaker and what I can appreciate is that you can see his good intention for all of us and he really wants us to, to grow. He's excited for us and you can't help but get excited for yourself with that. He's, um, what's the word, he's very... Um, I can't think of the word. You just, yeah, no, well, it's more than that. <laughs> He's not just an amazing guy, but yeah, he definitely is very knowledgeable and he gives us that knowledge in bite-sized pieces, so it's uh, it's really cool. The whole subject, is in so, so much mystery on it, and I think it's very much simplified for someone like us, it's very helpful. I also feel I mean, he's done so much research and everything he's he's said he's backed up. He's shown the statistics. He's shown the information. I think Christopher is, honestly, I think he's really amazing as a speaker and just his knowledge of finances and the financial situation and and just your overall guide for planning. I think he, he makes an excellent guide. We've had, we've had many in the past and he just by far outlasts them or, you know, outstands them, I guess. And yeah, I would say his, his energy for, and passion for the subject goes beyond what you would expect from the traditional financial planning sense in the sense that there is a lot of information behind it and um, reality as to, to why it should be done that way and, and things like that. It's not just opinion, there's fact. The information is objective. I feel like it's a, it can't be argued that it's wrong or that it's invalid or that it, that it wouldn't work. And in a lot of other cases, the, uh, the information just might sound good or might make you feel good. This is uh, something that clearly needs to be done, and it's based completely on what you want to do, not based on what somebody else wants to do, and you're not being judged on what those goals are. You're just, it's your goals. Find a way to make it happen. Well, one of the things I'd like to say about Christopher and his, and his training is it kind of strips away a lot of the false information that people have in the area of finances and financial management. There's a lot of misconceptions about how you handle finances and, and, and how money is manipulated and what you can do to create your own personal economy and so that you don't have to be victim to whatever happens out there, that you can run your organization and and you can create the life that you want by understanding financial laws. Uh, because Christopher wasn't like any other person I'd ever met regarding finances and financial planners. Um, when I met with him for dinner, uh, I used the, <laughs> you, met, you know the Jerry Maguire movie where she says I had you at, uh, you had me at a low? Yeah. He had me at household CFO. <laughs> so that was within the first 15 minutes because I'd never seen anybody approach it from the household being the client as opposed to, here's your practice, you're a doctor, how can we invest your money? This is a case study of the Econologics results-based financial planning system. We took a private practice professional who did a financial plan and we measured eight points of the financial condition of their household using Econometry Analytics, our proprietary measurement system. After one year of implementation of that plan, we took measurements of those same eight points. And here are the results. Case study number one. This is a private practice professional, uh, mid-40s in age. And at the start of their financial plan, 
They scored a 365 on the Financial Prosperity Index. Their net worth was just under $600,000, and they were making a gross income in their practice of about $386,000. The profit margin, however, was pretty good at 28.29%, but they're only putting away about $15,000 a year into retirement plans or any kind of future income planning assets. Their total debt-to-assets ratio was just under 51%, which basically means that of all the assets they had, just over 50% of those assets were encumbered by debt. Their emergency fund ratio was three and a half months, which means that they were able to handle their living expenses for three and a half months based on money that they had in a savings account. And their household risk index, which is the indicator of how much risk a household is taking with all of their assets, came in at 4.47. Now, one year later, we took these same measurements again, and we can see here that the financial prosperity index went up to 577. Their net worth jumped to 771,000, uh, primarily because their practice gross income jumped uh, to $650,000. The profit margin of the practice also went up to 37.65% and they were able to put away $25,000 in retirement type assets. The total debt to assets ratio went down to 41.98%, uh, while their emergency fund ratio went down to 1.2 months. The household risk index came in at 4.37. So if we do a side by side showing the before and after, we can see that they improved across the board with the exception of their emergency fund ratio, in which case they took money that they had in cash and simply paid off debt. Case study number two. This is a private practice professional, mid-40s, who came to us in the start of the plan. They had a 431 as the score of their financial prosperity index. Their net worth was about 1.2 million, and the gross income of their practice was just over 800,000. The profit margin of the practice was coming in just under 18%. Now they were taking $25,000 a year and putting it into some kind of reserves, whether it be retirement or some other kind of savings. And they had just under 20% of their assets encumbered by debt, showing their debt to assets ratio. The emergency fund ratio was at 1.9 months, which shows that they had just under two months of living expenses in a savings account. And their household risk index came in at 4.41, which was actually quite high for them. One year later, we saw the financial prosperity index jumped to 750 because they got a lot of their financial planning points in. Their net worth jumped to 1.8 million, and the practice gross income improved just over 10% to 891,000. The profit margin of the practice actually went to 15.68%, while they were able to take an additional $5,000 a year and put it away for retirement use. Their total debt to assets ratio went down to 13.53%, while the emergency fund ratio went up to 10.2 months. And the household risk index was cut drastically down to 3.45. So you can see when you look at the before and after econometry measurements, we see improvement in every area except for the profit margin of the practice. And we can see here that they took money that they would otherwise have taken out of the practice and spent and invested it in the practice in programs that would generate future income and growth for that practice. Case study number three. This is a private practice professional household with the ages of about 52 to 53. At the start of the plan, they took the financial prosperity index questionnaire and scored a 561 out of 850. Their net worth was about 1.8 million. The practice gross income was 1.6 million, a good producing practice, and the profit margin was about 21.3%. They were setting aside $44,000 a year in retirement-oriented assets. The total debt-to-assets ratio was 25%, which basically means that of all the assets they had, 25% of those assets were encumbered by some kind of debt. They had almost no reserves to handle emergencies in savings accounts because they had about a week of living expenses covered by their savings. And the household risk index was a 4.27, a little on the high side 
for their ages. One year later, we took these same measurements and the Financial Prosperity Index came in at 741. Their net worth went up to just over $2 million and the practice gross income increased to $1.684 million. The profit margin went to 14.76% while they took $60,000 in that year and put it away for retirement-oriented assets. The total debt-to-assets ratio went down because they paid off some debt, and the emergency fund ratio went up to just over three months by putting money in our savings accounts. And the household risk index came down to 4.08. So if you take a look at these eight measurements before and after, you will notice that the only one that went down was the profit margin of their practice. And anytime you put a plan in place, you realize that you're spending money that sometimes isn't producing future value. So what they did is they took income they would have taken a profit and they bought marketing programs and other strategies to help them build future income and value in that practice. So there are the results. The Ecologics results-based financial planning system is about objectively measuring your progress to achieving the optimal financial condition for your household. Your financial life basically breaks down to three values, each having a, an infinite level between them. Now the first thing we're going to find here is that there's something called income. All right? Now income is always the first thing we have to solve. First thing we have to solve is income. Because you can't have a positive financial condition with no money, with no income. Now, how many of you make more than enough income than you'll ever need? Ah, so now we see the first problem we have to overcome, right? That's the first problem we have to overcome, is that lack of income. Now, <clears throat> as you'll discover, that is a universal problem that we all have. There's not enough money because our appetites are bigger than our stomach, whatever you want to call it, right? Because all kinds of cool, shiny things to spend money on, of course. So we have to make more income. But have you ever had a financial advisor coach you on how to make more money? Now that is a problem because the whole community that we're operating in, in the financial planning community, has never looked at that as being part of our profession. Yet it is completely under the uh, auspices of financial planning as a subject. So the first thing we have to do is make more money. Now, I did not research that material. Someone else did all that. So I created a course based on, on uh, the measurement system you're using to come up with the 12 laws of income, which uh, we're going to be covering in the business viability course in a couple days. And, that, and if you apply those 12 laws of income, that is why income is made in any organization. And you're going to learn how to, to apply them to your, your, your practice specifically in detail. And you're going to go back to your practice and apply them. And you're going to hit those very specific areas of your business that are re fully responsible for the level of income you make. So you have complete control over that, rather than it being a mystery or a struggle or whatever the case may be. So we have to have income always as the first item of business. And then we have to figure out how we're going to expense our money. You can, I, I know people, professionals, who make a million dollars a year in personal income. That should be enough for just about anybody. But they spend a million one. And they're, they're hurting. You know, because as the income goes up, the toys get bigger. We don't have cars anymore. We have airplanes and, you know, extra houses in some island somewhere. Things like that. Which is totally fine. But you see, how we spend our money is, comes down to a real simple basic. I'm going to have you write down right now your top three life goals. Just write them down real quickly. Just Jot them down, your top three life goals. The most important things you want to accomplish while you're on this earth at this time. Just real, real quickly. Now once we have your top three life goals, we should probably have some kind of idea what they're going to cost. For example, someone says, I want to, I want to retire with $100,000 a year of income. Okay. How much money do you, are you going to need to have to produce $100,000 of income that you can't outlive? Rough numbers. Well, if you make 5% a year, 
how much we need in a lump sum of cash to throw off at 5%, throw off 100 grand a year? 2 million bucks. 2 million bucks. Okay? Now, that's not a small sum of money. But we all say we want to retire, for example, as a goal. But we, don't have, we have a disconnect between what it's actually going to cost us to be able to do that. So the reason I bring that up is if you take a look at your top three life goals, I want you to ask yourself, uh, is that where the majority of your money is being expensed? You see, I often find that people do not spend their money to fund their goals. I see there's a disconnect there. And it's one of two reasons. Either one, they aren't really goals. They're dreams, wishes, something that'd be nice to have. But we have more immediate goals, like how we look, or what we drive, or, or where our kids go to school, or things like that. OK? And uh, that's totally fine. I have no problem with that. But the whole idea of financial planning is aligning your expenditures with your life goals. If you just do that, you've gotten the basic product of financial planning. So the whole purpose of, the, of, of this course is to get you to really set in crystal clear uh, vision what your goals really are and what it's actually going to cost you to achieve them. So you have a realistic point of view of what we have to expense out of our income, our day-to-day -day routine to fund those goals. I mean, I have to ask you a question. How many of you want to be debt-free? Good. How many of you want to be able to derive an income independent of your private practice? Okay. The only way you're going to be able to do that is to buy it. In other words, to take a significant portion of your income every year and put it away. How much? We're going to talk about this. I'll give you one figure. A couple others we'll take later. Take your age, multiply it by one, and then multiply that or add 0.5 onto that. So take 1.5 times your age. So if you're 50 years old, you should be saving at least 75 grand a year. If you're 40, 60 grand a year. That's minimum. Because you see, because you're in a body, you have a, you have an, a finite lifespan. So you have a time limit on how much you need to save to, to achieve an income goal. Businesses can go on forever if they're turned over. But bodies can't. And financial planning has the, has the restriction of dealing with a lifespan. Okay? So if you want to you know, um, buy a half a million dollar house in 10 years, how much do you need to save a year? 50 grand. 50 grand a year for 10 years, $500,000, go buy your house if you don't want to use a mortgage. You get the idea? It's that simple. It's not any harder than that. See, I, I find it interesting that people get caught up in rates of return on investments, like that's going to have some effect on your financial plan. It doesn't. It's not nearly as important as we have, have been conditioned to believe it is. And why have, we be how, why have we been conditioned to believe that? Because everyone you talk to in the investment field says they can get a better return than the other person. Okay? That's nonsense. At the end of the day, here's what you need to know about, about your financial future in, in investments and so on and so forth. On one hand, you're going to have inflation and taxes take away the value of your spending money. On the other hand, you're going to have to create a pool of assets that does what? Keeps pace with inflation and taxes. And if you do that, regardless of the rates of return, you win. Do you see? Because how many of you believe that the, that the rates of inflation being told to you by government statistics are truthful statistics? I tend to be a little critical of that. You see? And taxes, where do you think taxes are going to be going forward, up or down, as far as rates? Up. Absolutely up. And unless you plan on making a lot less income than you're making now, throughout your retirement, does anybody have that goal? I want less income in retirement than I have now? No one has ever raised their hand. Yet, the tax advice being promoted is based on the fact that you're going to have a lower income. So defer all your taxes today into a lower taxable income in the future. The only way that can be 
is if you have less income. Do you see it? Do you see the logic there? No one wants that. So you have to save and provide for your own future. And if we don't expense our, our, our current income into those goals that are most important to us, the, the unfortunate reality is that we're not going to have the money there to do them. That's just the truth of it. I don't want that for you. So we have to be intelligent about how we spend our money and how we navigate the investment world and, and uh, the tax world and, and the, the risk world, which brings us to our next point, so that we don't have to deal with these things. The third one is protection. Did you know that as a private practice owner, there are 87 specific risks you face every day, any one of which can cause an economic loss? What's a risk? A risk is something that happens that causes a loss. Now you got a million of them in your business. You have a rogue employee, a patient that sues you, you have a regulatory risk, risk of tax audits, risk of a Medicare audit for some of you. you get the idea. They go on and on. But let's take it out of the practice for a minute. Look in your household. You got the risk of dying too soon, living too long, having health issues. Okay, how about something, maybe one of your kids does something, creating some liability for you? How about investing your money? There's a lot of risk in there. And you're gonna find out at the end of this course that you're, you're all taking way more risk than you probably would be taking if you knew all about those 87 different risks and how they affect you. Every one of you. The truth of the matter is, if you've experienced any kind of loss at all, here's what happened. You had a predictable risk that was not provided for. That's what happened. Stock market risk, I mean, look at stock market risk, for example. Statistically, one out of every four years is going to be a negative year in the stock market. Just know that. So we have our all, all retirement plans being built up over a certain period of time, knowing that one out of every four years we're going to get punched in the mouth. How many of you love that idea? And yet, where do we invest our money? Because that's the advice we're getting and that's what everybody does. Okay, so we have, we, we have different approaches to that because there's no reason for the market to crash and you to have any attention on it at all. That's abnormal. Do you see? Because where should your attention be? Living your life. Killing it in your business. Spending time with your kids, seeing the world, doing what it is you want to do. Not freaking out because the market crashed 40%. How many of you know a professional who was about age 55, 60, in that range, in 2002, 2003, who was like, that's it, I'm gonna retire. You know anybody like that? We all do, don't we? What happened? What happened? They're back to work, aren't they? Because here's what happened. They had their net worth wrapped up in basically three elements. Real estate, their business, their practice, and their retirement plan, which was heavily invested in the markets. All of a sudden, we have a predictable, manufactured crash. Nothing happens by accident in the world of, of economics. Crash. And now this person saw half their net worth wiped out it, like that. But who could have predicted it? Well, we have 100 years of pretty statistical, strong statistical data to show that's going to happen. It's not a surprise. And yet we act surprised. Do you see? Who should have to do that? Who should have to be 60 years old and say, you know what? I have to go back to work now because my, last, my retirement's now shot. I have to put it off for 10, 15 years now. Who wants to do that? Exactly. Control your own life. And controlling your own life is protecting what you've created. And it's a pretty vast subject. So we're going to cover that a lot during this time together. But you see... If you want to achieve the optimum financial condition, you have to take, you gotta make a lot of income, you gotta be very smart in how you expend your money, and you gotta protect what you have. And the higher degree you continue to do that and keep those in balance, the more optimum your condition will be.